is um, 3 p.m. German time. We're nearing 150 participant, participants. So let me welcome you to a very special Distinguished Lecture Series seminar this afternoon. Um, as you might know, the DLS seminars are the main high profile scientific event of our institute, the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. And it's a means to engage the most important and influential colleagues in any area of the science of light. And this is a special DLS seminar for two reasons, because usually our seminars on, are on Thursdays at 3 p.m. and not on Mondays. And the reason for that is that yesterday was the International Day of Light, and it makes a lot of sense for an institute concerned with the science of light to celebrate the Day of Light with a special seminar. Um, it is also special because we usually in, uh, have invited distinguished lecturers from outside the institute and not inside the institute. But of course, we also have very distinguished uh, lecture uh, researchers uh, at the institute. And this is definitely true for one of the two founding directors of MPL, Philip Russell. And to give the occasion even more weight than this being our event to celebrate the Day of Light, it is also almost to the day the 30th anniversary of Philip Russell inventing the photonic crystal fiber, which he is famous for. Um, so Philip does not need a lot of introduction around here and in general, and he asked me to keep this short, so I will do that. Um, he got a PhD at the University of Oxford in 1979, uh, then spent a few years as a research fellow at Oriel College and then subsequently worked at many universities or several universities and research establishments in the US, France, the UK, before uh, eventually founding the MPL in Erlangen in 2009. Um, he has received many awards, uh, among them uh, OSA awards, IEEE awards, EPS awards. Um, uh, he got the Bertolt Leibinger Zukunftspreis, the Rank Prize for Optoelectronics and a couple of others. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society and the Optical Society of uh, America, whose president he was in 2015. So you can see even from this very short introduction that it doesn't get much more distinguished than this. Um, before handing over to Philip, um, and Philip, I guess you can already start sharing your screen. Okay. Um, a few technical comments. This seminar is re being recorded. So please be aware that by participating from this point on, actually from when you joined already onwards, you have implicitly agreed to doing this. And the second point is that uh, please keep your mics and cameras turned off during the presentation just to avoid any sort of background noise and interference. If you have a question, uh, you can type the letter Q or a question or your actual question into the chat. And then we will un I, I will ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Um, I guess you can do that for very urgent questions throughout, but mostly this will be done at the end. And so without much further ado, um, let's ride the wave with Philip. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. Um, if not, please let me know, Jochen. That's very good. Yeah, very good. So uh, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. And so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Philip Russell, as Jochen explained. <laughs> And I'm going to attempt uh, this afternoon to give you an overview of the emergence of photonic crystal fiber um, uh, over the last three decades of riding the photonic crystal fiber wave. So thanks, thanks for joining me. Um, so before I'd, I start, I'm, I'd, uh, before I'd start, um, the reason I'm actually giving this lecture, I thought I'd just uh, tell you, was that it has to do with a certain John Dudley. You may have heard of John Dudley. He's a professor at the University of, uh, of uh, Franche-Comté in France. Um, he was actually the principal architect behind the 2015 International Year of Light. And he happened to give a lecture at uh, the Institute here a few weeks ago. In the course of his lecture, he pointed out that the International Day of Light uh, this year almost exactly coincides with the day 30 years ago when I made some quick jottings in a notebook on the idea of photonic crystal fiber. At the time in May 1991, I was attending the conference on lasers and electro-optics in Baltimore. So thanks, John, for the opportunity to give this lecture. It wouldn't have happened otherwise, actually. So, uh, okay, so I, um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, photonic crystal fibers and 
Um, here are just, uh, just some pictures of the four main types of fibers. They all have an array of hollow channels, microscopic hollow, hollow channels running along their length. Um, they come in the solid glass, they have solid glass cores and hollow glass cores and all kinds of different varieties. So I'm gonna talk about some of these fibers, how they work, where the idea came from and so on. So let me start with where did the idea come from? Um, uh, well, obviously this started, uh, well, what prompted me, what prompted the idea in the first place? Well, obviously one of the first things was optical fibers. Um, if we look back in history, in the middle of the 19th century, the Swiss scientist Daniel Colladon demonstrated that you could guide light in a water jet. Um, probably people had seen this before and almost certainly, but uh, this was the first scientific explanation of, of the effect. Uh, this was taken up by the Irish scientist John Tyndall, who was actually a very accomplished science communicator. He became very famous for this experiment and he actually overshadowed Colladon, as it turns out. So his name is attached to this experiment rather than Colladon. But the physics behind this effect is, of course, total internal reflection. Um, and in, uh, in uh, fiber optics, the, the water in, the, in that experiment of a water jet is replaced with glass. It's a little more complicated, of course. Um, and I'm gonna show you here a cross section of a, uh, a current telecommunications fiber. <clears throat> it consists of um, a, a, a glass core, which has a slightly higher refractive index than the surrounding cladding, as we call it. Um, and because of this difference in refractive index, total internal reflection can operate, which is to say the rays of light um, can bounce uh, to and fro inside the core and at, at certain angles for certain wavelengths and so on, uh, at certain angles, a mode can form in there, a, a guided mode. Now the idea for telecoms fibers is one of, I, I think it has to be one of the greatest inventions. It dates back to um, Charles Cow in 1966. And he was the person who, um, who proposed that glass fibers could be used in telecommunications. Um, at the time, this was viewed as a totally stupid, crazy idea, it would never work. And everyone could think of reasons why not, but uh, he turned out to be correct. And so he won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for they had to wait a long time to get the prize. So that was the first ingredient. What about the next um, ingredient um, in this idea? Well, the other ingredient, uh, this was a, a very exciting idea back at the end of the 1980s. Uh, this was a novel idea of photonic band gaps. So let me talk a little bit about photonic band gaps and photonic crystals. So um, back in the, <clears throat> in the 18th century, Thomas Young, um, was working on uh, trying to understand what light was. Um, and he proved in an experiment that he reported in 1801 at the Royal Society, he gave a lecture actually, the Beccarian lecture, um, proving that light in, indeed was, was wave-like. And if you actually look at that paper, it's quite funny back then in the, in the Royal Society in London, you didn't write your paper, you, you delivered a lecture and then somebody else wrote the, wrote the lecture up as a paper. So, so it's recorded in the third person, <laughs> kind of funny. So light is a wave, um, and, and then 100 years later, Gustav Mee uh, carried out some quite complicated uh, calculations on how uh, light interacts with small particles. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, uh, he showed and, and explored the way in which light can resonate with a wavelength scale structure. And of course, there are many examples of this in nature. Uh, think of uh, thin oil layer on water or the colors of a, of a, of a, of a bubble. Uh, the butterflies often have beautiful colors that are caused by iridescence. That beetle is particularly beautiful. It, it diffracts, it, it, it takes sunlight and distills it into different colors depending on the angle that you look at it from. So there are many examples of, of the wave nature of light. Um, so let's see. And uh, one of the nicest examples, at least in, in my view, is, is the opal. Um, if you get a really nice dark opal, and uh, there's an example of it in a video in the top right there, as sunlight uh, strikes it, you get all the colors of the rainbow depending on the angle. And what's happening here is that inside that opal are closely packed lattices of nanoscale silica spheres. And depending on the angle and the spacing of the spheres, when light, white light comes in, you, you see different colors emerging from the, from the opal. <clears throat> and this is caused by 
uh, by a phenomenon uh, called Bragg scattering. It has nothing to do with the, the color of the material. The material doesn't have any intrinsic dye or color. This has to do with the structure. It's called structural color. So let's, let's just discuss a little bit and yeah, um, what's actually going on in the physics here. The physics of this is Bragg scattering. Um, and this dates back 100 years, more or less, to the Bragg father and son, this partnership, who both who won the Nobel Prize together in 1915. And the idea here is that, um, uh, that if we have, uh, just to explain what the Bragg condition is, if we have a whole lot of uh, layers, uh, if, and each of these layers reflects, reflects light very, very weakly, then um, what you find is if you, if you change the angle of the light coming in at a certain angle, um, which is called the Bragg angle, there's a strong cumulative reflection um, uh, that you see. And there's a condition associated with this, which is the Bragg condition. I'm not gonna talk about the maths here. It's quite a simple condition. Um, but uh, when the reflection is weak, you get a, you could, this condition is actually very, very well defined. If however, the reflection from each of these layers is very strong, then the Bragg condition starts to become indeterminate. So there's no longer an exact angle where you get reflection, you get reflection over a wide range of angles. Now, uh, if that range of angles is very large um, and we superimpose two other sets of these planes on top of each other, and you do things correctly, you can actually prevent light from penetrating to the center of the, of the material here. So light can't get in. And if you also think a little bit about so making sure there aren't any internal modes, there can be modes inside a material that don't get out. You have to suppress them as well. If you manage to do that, then what you will have done is to create a two dimensional photonic band gap material within which light, at least in two dimensions, cannot exist. Um, this isn't just simply blocking light. If light is on a, you cannot create light inside that, that uh, region of space. This idea, uh, is due to Eli Yablonovich, and he actually went one step further and suggested that you could switch light off fundamentally. You could suppress the formation of light within three dimensions, which really was a revolutionary idea. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about two-dimensional photonic band gaps. <clears throat> and of course, I've talked about fibers. We've talked about photonic band gaps. I thought it might be interesting to put them together. So uh, one could have, for example, a hollow core and have a photonic band gap uh, material uh, uh, surrounding the core as in this little picture here in my notes. And uh, what would happen then is if light of a certain wavelength came in, let's say red light of a certain angle, you might find there isn't any photonic band gap. If I switch to blue light and change the angle, there's also no photonic band gap. But if I find the correct wavelength, then I would find that yellow light in this case would hit a photonic band gap. It wouldn't be able to escape and so the light could bounce to and fro and form a guided mode. So that was the idea. Uh, so one of the very first things that we had to do way back at, in those early 90s was to check if a two-dimensional photonic band gap, would, band gap would actually exist in, in a glass air structure. So this, this required a certain amount of searching. Uh, it was far from clear whether this would work. I thought it would probably work, but that was a back of the envelope calculation. So we had to, we had to call upon um, numer numerical modelers to solve Maxwell's equations for us. Now this was the early days of computers. So, you know, it was, this was just when PCs uh, were beginning to be able to do co really complicated calculations. So it was kind of nice that that happened at the same time. Anyway, John Roberts, who did the simulations and it's published in this paper, did actually show that on this diagram, and I'm not going to discuss the diagram, there isn't time for that, but the essential thing is that we find these, uh, we did indeed find that there were two dimensional photonic band gaps in the correct region of, of this diagram where light is able to propagate in a hollow core, but it's unable to escape into the cladding. So that's what the photonic band gap does for you. So light can propagate in the hollow core and form a mode, but it's blocked from escaping into the cladding by this two dimensional photonic band gap. Okay, that was some theory. So we were happy that at least the idea might work. But of course, the next big problem was uh, how on earth could you make such a complex structure? Could it even be made? Uh, the trouble was no one had actually tried to make something like, something like this before. So, so you're kind of the very first person who's trying to do it. And so you, I must say, you are, I, mean, I was full of doubt, and, and, but still we kept trying. What I'm trying to say is that the hardest part of any journey if it hasn't been done before by someone else is taking the first step 
and this was certainly true of making the first photonic crystal fiber. The very first thing I tried was the obvious thing in a way was to find a stub of silica glass and ask the technicians and we were in South, I was in Southampton at this time to drill holes uh, along the glass stub and create a two dimensional crystal which you would then draw down to fiber. This didn't work because the drill pieces kept breaking and silica is a very hard material so we kind of gave that up. I, cutting a long story short, we ended up, as we still do, and many other groups do this as well, we ended up making the fibers by stacking glass capillaries into a preform of the structure we want, drawing it down to, in one stage, to what we call a cane. This is a fairly stiff thing that's a few millimeters in diameter, and then drawing it down in one step more down to the, the final optical fiber. Um, in fact, this idea of stacking capillaries wasn't entirely new. If you go back to 1974, there are very few th new things in the world, uh, but uh, back in 1974, uh, in this paper by Kaiser and Astle at um, the Bell System, published in the Bell System Technical Journal, they actually did stack capillaries. And the reason they were doing this was to form small cores um, in, to, small, to create small cores here at the intersections between these glass, uh, these glass webs and guide light there. They wanted to make single mode waveguides. This was before modern telecoms fibers had been invented. Anyway, so we had found a way of making these structures. And then as is often the case, serendipity stepped in and, start, and played a role. So in, in looking for a photonic band gap and trying to make a fiber that guided by photonic band gap effects, we actually chanced upon something else. And this something else was actually rather like what these guys were doing back in 1974. They, they were able to create waveguides here at these intersections. So we, we find something quite similar. In fact, the very first PCF that we made, and here I would like to acknowledge the fantastic uh, 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 contributions of Tim Burks and Jonathan Knight. Tim Burks joined the project in 1993 as a postdoc and Jonathan joined about a year later. So these two really made, every, made the experiments happen. So this is Jonathan's first fiber. It didn't have any core. He was just testing the technology, but he did find that there was accidental, accidental guidance at structural defects in, in, the, in the transverse structure. So he then went back and put a, deliberately put a core in the center and created the first photonic crystal fiber, which was published back in 1996. Um, you notice there are asterisks there. This is because we, uh, we'd all moved, by the time this was published, we'd all moved to the University of Bath where we were setting up a new group, all three of us. So what's, uh, what's so special about this, about this, this uh, first photonic crystal fiber? It doesn't have a photonic band gap, but it does something else that's interesting, which is that it acts as a sieve for light. Um, that's to say the fundamental mode is well guided uh, and in very simple terms, and this is uh, not really a physical description of why this works, it has a very large head, so it, it can't squeeze between these hollow channels. The hollow channels act as strong barriers to, to the light escaping, and, and in order for the light to escape, it has to squeeze between the, the gaps, and the, and the fundamental mode can't, whereas the higher order modes that have smaller features are able to escape. Another way of looking at this is that the resolution limit of the this mode is smaller than the resolution limit of the fundamental mode so so this one is guided whereas so the one on the left is guided and the one on the right is not is not guided leaks away so we had we made an end the endlessly single mode pcf in this case so i did say we moved to bath um it's a it's a very beautiful place uh, some of you may have visited it it's a, it's most of the city was built in the 18th century it's a georgian city made with this beautiful honey colored, uh, made from this local stone, the honey colored stone. Uh, find, the university itself though was founded in 1966 and is I would say far from beautiful. It has some nice grounds, but the buildings are not so nice. So <laughs> the burghers of the town uh, insisted that the university be out of sight of the city center. So when you looked up at this hill where the university is based, you, you couldn't see it. Anyway, so we moved to Bath and we, we really enjoyed uh, life there. Uh, we had to set up new labs um, and we were very lucky actually back in 1998 uh, because British Telecom Laboratories um, had an old tower, a historic drawing tower, um, uh, which has three legs. You can see one, two, three legs. This is Clive Day, who was one of the early researchers in the field of fiber optics. 
um, they donated this to us. And even though it was a museum piece, it enabled us to make some of the first PCF, quite a few of the first PCF breakthroughs. There's Jonathan uh, setting the tower up. This is a picture of me. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later. This was in preparation for a feature article in, in the New Scientist magazine. It was slightly embarrassing, but uh, anyway. Uh, let me show you some of the very first PCFs that were drawn in Bath by this three-legged tower. Um, the first, one of the first things we made was supercontinuum PCF, which has a very small core and is used for generating white light. I'll talk about that in a minute. We also made the very first photonic band gap guiding fiber. It didn't have a hollow core, but we did get some very beautiful pictures out of that. Um, we made multi-core PCFs. It's also a very colorful picture. And this is some of the, these are some pictures of some of the very first hollow core photonic crystal fibers. Um, very colorful field. And uh, I think the, the colorfulness of this and the, and the fact that photonic band gaps was a fashionable topic and photonic crystals, everything, everyone was very excited about this. Of course, as a result of that, journalists got interested. And we had all kinds of contacts from all kinds of magazines and TV and radio and so on. Uh, and in the course of uh, the planning of an article for New Scientist, I mentioned this before, the article was entitled Holy Light. Uh, I like to say that the word holy does have to have an E in it, please. There are one or two papers in the literature where it doesn't have an E. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, the, the guy, the slightly crazy guy from this magazine, uh, he was a cameraman actually, a photographer, insisted on in putting me behind a whole pile of tubes and I should peer through it and, and have myself photographed. Uh, which has nothing to do with fibers uh, at all. Um, <laughs> sometime later, I discovered this uh, far side uh, cartoon by Gary Larson. And if I just read it, it was foolish for Russell to approach the hornet's nest in the first place, but his timing was particularly bad. And you can see this is the angry hour. Um, so it, they, they, these two pictures are so similar that I, I just couldn't resist putting it in here so you could see it. So another example of how the journalist got interested has to do with uh, photonic crystal fibers or photonic crystals in nature. This is a very nice paper if you like to read it by Andrew Parker. Um, so this is an animal called a sea mouse. It, has, uh, it, it lives in mud, uh, which makes it all the more strange that, uh, that uh, when you take it out of the mud and wash the mud off and let the sunlight hit it, the, its, its hairs, its, the spines of its, of its coat uh, are, are iridescent, with beautiful colors, all the colors of the rainbow here. Um, and this got some, some Australian scientists very interested in, in what was going on. So they had a look at the spines of this animal and discovered that they consisted of a whole lot of hollow channels in what looks very much like a photonic crystal fiber uh, made from this material, alpha chitin. And the, the, these white dots are hollow channels. Um, of course, the, the journalist again got interested, and this is an article from a local newspaper in Bath, high-tech sea mice beats prof to answer. It's taken 10 years for a Bath scientist to understand what a species of sea worms has known for millions of years. Certainly it makes a good story. Uh, it may or may, may be so, or it may, may not be so, but uh, anyway, so it's rather fun when you get you talk to journalists, they come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. And then finally, um, this is one of the very first pictures of the holocore photonic band gap fiber made in Bath. The experiments were all very simple. Take a short length of fiber, white light source, a microscope. And with a microscope, you can zoom in, take a look at what's going on. And you see this blob of light that seems to be floating in space, almost not touching the glass as we go around the, around the edge. Um, then the, the Economist magazine so much liked the idea of photonic band gaps and photonic crystals that they ran a feature on it. And the title was New Age Crystals. I should hasten to add that there's nothing new age about this work. Uh, it is hard science. <laughs> but they produced this rather nice cartoon. Um, and this guy here in the middle, his hat says guide. So he's taking charge of the photons. These squiggles are, by the way, in case you didn't know, these are photons. They do go very fast and there are lots and lots of photons. So you need to have an assistant um, uh, to manage everything. Uh, so this was the economist's take on, on photonic band gap materials. And the funniest thing about this is that I'm pretty sure this cartoon, this is meant to be Eli Yablonovich. Uh, and I've never actually asked him if it is or isn't, but it does look a little bit like him, I have to say. 
So let me move on to what's it good for. So all this effort to make these uh, photonic crystal fibers, um, wh what's the point? I mean, if you're going to put all this effort in, you need to have some idea of why it might be interesting. Although I have to confess at the beginning, I was just interested, just curious to see whether it was possible. And I didn't have any clear idea about applications, well, not really. Um, so one of the first things that uh, emerged was that you could generate white light that was tens of thousands of times brighter than the sun by controlling the chromatic dispersion in, in, the, in the fibers. And I'd like just here to explain a little bit about, about what chromatic dispersion is. I think some people in the audience are not physicists. So a nice example of this that I really like uh, is atmospheric whistlers. Uh, these are very low frequency radio waves generated by lightning. So lightning strikes in, in the Northern Hemisphere, let's say up here. Um, and I didn't want that to happen, let me go back. So, so uh, the lightning extractor creates these Whistler waves that, that travel along the geomagnetic field lines. And as they travel, the higher frequencies, the, the higher frequencies travel uh, more quickly, so they arrive first. So you get this kind of whistle uh, of descending frequencies. The reason for that is that, the, uh, that we have anomalous dispersion. And actually, effects like this have actually been observed on Jupiter um, by Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which I think is quite interesting. So let me get off that page. So, so chromatic dispersion, when it's anomalous, means the higher frequencies arrive first, just like the whistlers. And you get exactly the same effect in a hollow core waveguide. I mean, a waveguide with nothing in there, so it's just, just hollow. The optical modes that are guided in that waveguide will have anomalous dispersion, which is to say the high frequencies, the bluer light arrives first. If I take a typical bulk material, it has the opposite sign of dispersion. It has what we call normal dispersion, which is that the bluer light travels more slowly or the red light arrives first. So if we put these two things together, um, and fill the core with, with some bulk material, uh, what you, the dispersion you end up with, the chromatic dispersion you end up with depends on the balance between the dimensions of the core and the material you put in there and so on. And this actually is the reason why these piece, solid core PCFs are so interesting. So <clears throat> it turns out that if you, if you tune things correctly so that the chromatic dispersion is close to zero and you send a pulse of light in, the pulse uh, the pulses disperse very slowly, or that's to say they lengthen in time very slowly as they travel. As a result, you can maintain a short pulse can have very high intensity. You can maintain a high intensity over long distances. And this enhances all kinds of nonlinear effects, including this thing called supercontinuum generation, which is one of the most dramatic things to emerge from this field at the end of the 1990s. And this paper by Ranka and so on, this optics letter from 2000. And this has created a revolution in ultra bright white light sources. Um, and in fact, there are now many commercial versions widely available and they're present in many labs all over the world. Um, so the, 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 it's a dramatic experiment. You send in invisible pulses of, of infrared light into the fiber. The fiber is, has, a, has a small core. Uh, it's designed so that the, so that, so the, the chromatic dispersion is, is close to zero. And, and as a result, you get all the colors of the rainbow emerging. And what's actually going on here is nonlinear optics. Nonlinear optics is, is uh, something uh, maybe a little abstract, difficult to explain. So I'm gonna explain this with an audio demonstration. Um, if you have an audio amplifier and you drive it too hard, you get all kinds of distortion. And this is because new frequencies are being created. Okay, I think that's probably enough of that, but that's exactly what Jimi Hendrix was doing when he, he performed the Star Spangled Banner back in Woodstock in 1969. That the reason for all that strange sound is because of new frequencies being generated with his guitar through all kinds of distortion in the amplifier and also in the instrument itself and so on. Anyway, by creating all these new frequencies, um, it, it, it's the presence of all of this very broad, uh, all these different uh, frequencies of light enabled uh, Ted Hench to realize a dream of his, which was the creation of an oct octave spanning frequency comb for ultra precise optical clocks. And he shared the uh, 2005 Physics Nobel Prize partly for this work 
with Jan Paul, and I recommend you look at the Nobel website if you want more details on, on that experiment. But this, this was a true revolution in the field of ultra-precise optical clocks. So what's it good for? Well, another topic that I've had a lot of fun with over the years um, is microscopic quartz oscillators that are driven by light and used to mode lock fiber lasers. So I talk about quartz oscillators. Let's just have a, have a look at this. So uh, we're talking here about a photonic crystal fiber with a very small core and very large hollow channels surrounding the core. And as a result of that, um, the light is strongly confined in the core, but also uh, acoustic vibrations or mechanical vibrations are very strongly confined in the core. So the overlap between the vibrations and the light is, is very high. So you can get a very strong interaction between sound and light in this case. Now the frequencies of this, uh, this uh, resonance in the core acoustic uh, vibration are in the two gigahertz range. That's 2000 million cycles per second. This is a very high frequency. It's a very high frequency quartz oscillator, much higher frequency than the typical one you find in, in watches. Uh, it's about 60,000 times faster. Um, now, if, if you get a laser that produces a train of pulses and this train of pulses has a repetition rate which corresponds to the frequency of the acoustic resonance in the core, you can get a very strong interaction between sound and light. Um, and this enables you to, uh, to, through what we call optomechanical back action, to very stably mode lock a fiber laser with, with lots of pulses going round and round in the, in the fiber laser. They are exciting an acoustic wave in the photonic crystal fiber and um, <clears throat> enabling you to, to produce a very stable uh, train of pulses um, at, at this frequency, this very high frequency of a few gigahertz. And there's an example of a pulse for the uh, physicists amongst you that uh, was produced by Wen Bin Hur, who was a PhD student at the time. Uh, this, these are pulses less than 120 seconds in duration with a repetition rate of close to two gigahertz. Um, and this is rock steady. It can run for weeks without, um, without uh, drifting. So another topic, what's it good for? I have several of these. I'm going to whiz through them uh, quickly. Um, the next thing which we've had a huge amount of fun with is, uh, is chiral photonic crystal fibers. Um, uh, now, chiral structures, there are lots of them uh, around when you keep your eyes open. I mean, if you ever visit Valencia and you visit the um, visit the, uh, the silk market in, in Valencia. It has these beautiful um, chiral or spiral uh, columns that are supporting its roof. Um, <laughs> more, more, more contemporary example uh, is, is, this, um, uh, is this vertical axis wind turbine, which has, also has a, has a chiral uh, nature. So let me just show you a picture of two PCFs. So this is one that is straight, it's untwisted. It has a solid glass core. These, these dots here are the hollow channels. Um, and here on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the right is a twisted version. So we do this by spinning the preform during the fiber drawing process. So we, can, we end up with a twisted structure like this. So let's imagine that there is a mode in the core. Now the mode is never going to be perfectly circular because of the presence of the hollow channels. It's going to have some kind of hexagonal kind of shape to it in both cases. This means that as the mode travels uh, the, in the, on the right here, it's going to be forced to rotate as it travels following the twist. And um, so <clears throat> if, if I actually send the light in, then on the left, the mode travels along without, the, without rotating. And this red arrow is the direction of the electric field polarization, the direction of the electric field of the light. And in the twisted case, the mode rotates exactly with the twist but the, the, the electric field of the light, this linearly polarized light rotates much more slowly, but does rotate with the twist more or less as it travels. And this effect is known, is known as optical um, rotation or optical activity. And the reason is that left and right circularly polarized modes have slightly different phase velocities, it turns out. It's a bit technical, but um, that's what's going on here. And in fact, these fibers ena enable you to maintain circularly polarized light the, the, without it uh, wandering from being circularly polarized. And that led us to revisit um, uh, supercontinuum generation um, in a twisted fiber 
because the idea here was that maybe we could generate a very broad uh, supercontinuum spectrum, which was perfectly circularly polarized over its entire uh, 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 bandwidth. So these were experiments with a non-twisted PCF. And this, by the way, is something called a Poincaré sphere. You don't need to know what it is. But uh, if, if the dots on here are at the top, and these dots are all at different, uh, different colors of light and different powers and so on, if all the dots were sitting at the top, then the light would be perfectly right circularly polarized. If they were sitting at the bottom, they'd be perfectly left circularly polarized. So on the untwisted PCF, we launch in a right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized light, the polarization state is completely random coming out of the supercontinuum. If we do the same experiment with the twisted PCF, you get almost perfect maintenance of the circular polarization state. So this is the first example of an ultra bright, ultra broadband source of circularly polarized supercontinuum light. Um, and uh, why is circularly polarized light of, of interest? Well, it's important potentially for detecting chiral molecules such as proteins, because these molecules display circular dichroism and it gives you a very sensitive way of detecting different chiralities of, of these molecules. So another thing we've been playing with and discovering was uh, what's it good for? Well, this is, I'm not quite sure what this is good for, but it's certainly very fascinating. Um, is, is the discovery of new kinds of guidance um, in a fiber that actually doesn't have a core. It's a coreless twisted PCF, which acts rather like a chiral, I like to call it a wormhole for light. Um, if I go back to the late 1990s, I used to give talks a lot on, on photonic crystal fibers. And this was one of the pictures that I used to show. This is one of the first PCFs that we made. It doesn't have a core. It's, and I used to say, photonic crystal fibers are useless without defects. You need to have, uh, you need to form, a, form cores to guide light. Turns out that's not strictly true because if you actually uh, take a, a, a PCF with no, no core and you, and you chirally twist it, it does actually guide light. And it, you can actually form modes. And as you increase the twist rate, this is uh, increasing the twist rate of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the spiral, the diameter of the mode shrinks as the twist rate goes up. And this, this is experimental results and uh, simulations. So we, we pretty much understand, quite well understand what's going on here. In fact, there's a strong connection between this observation and the general theory of relativity. If you want to have a look at this physics.org uh, website, you'll find an article with called optical fiber with Einstein effect. In fact, we use the general equations of relativity or equations that are very similar to analyze the guidance of light here. One final weird thing about this, uh, these modes is that the light has, uh, has a negative effective mass. That's to say, when you push it in one direction, it goes in the opposite direction. And this is seen when you bend the fiber. So if you bend the fiber and this is the inside of the bend and that's the outside, normally you expect a mode to, to be thrown to the outside of the bend when you go around the corner. But in this case, the mode moves towards the inside of the bend because it has negative effective mass. Um, uh, which is a sort of fascinating thing to observe. It's what's even more interesting is, is modeling going around the bend here. Uh, that has a double meaning in English. But <laughs> so this is light going around the bend. I mean, not only is the light going around the bend, but these hollow channels are swirling around in a chiral manner as you, as you travel along the fiber. And somehow, rather, the light is able to rearrange itself. The mode is able to rearrange itself and follow the structure as it travels along. So what else is it good for? Well, now I'd like to get on to hollow core PCF. So far I've talked about entirely about uh, fibers with solid glass cores. The hollow core PCF is, is I think the most revolutionary here because this allows you to keep light tightly focused in low index materials such as well, vacuum obviously, or air or maybe water or any material which has, has a lower index than the glass itself. So if we think about the problem of <clears throat> getting very high intensity light. Um, the only way to really to do this is to take a lens and focus the light down to a very small spot. Now you can get very high intensity and get a very small spot, but you can't do this over long distances because the, as, as Lord Rayleigh uh, explained a hundred years ago, again, the, the, the diameter of the spot. So you'd like this to be very small to get very high intensity, have lots and lots of power kind of concentrated in one point in space. If you make that very small, then the depth of focus gets small as well. 
So you really can't get around this. It's a fundamental limitation with the physics says, you, hey, hey guys, you can't, you can't do this. You can't maintain very high intensity over long distances, which is something you'd love to do to enhance nonlinear effects, coming back to nonlinear effects. Um, and you can't do this in, in vacuum or in gases or whatever very easily. And this is, this is where the holocore photonic crystal fiber steps in, providing the first practical solution of, um, of, uh, of keeping light tightly focused over almost infinite distances. Um, and uh, the numbers are really fairly dramatic here. The best holocore fi uh, fibers are more than 7 million, maybe 10 million times better than a focused laser beam. In, in, in terms of high intensity and long distance. So what is this good for? Well, one of the things it's good for is, is enabling a new era of gas-based nonlinear optics. And those aren't entirely my words, as I'll explain in a minute. Um, this is the very first paper that uh, came out of the Bath group. And what we did was to fill a holocore fiber with hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is a Raman active gas, which means that if you launch in light of a certain color, in this case, green light, you generate red light and blue light. And these are called the Stokes and anti-Stokes bands. And this is done through phase modulation with the molecules of hydrogen themselves. It's mainly the vibration and the vibrational motion that actually causes this huge change in color inside the fiber. And it's the long interaction length that the fibers offer that made this Made this, it made it possible to do this experiment at very low, at very low energies. Um, as is said down here, these energies are almost two orders of magnitude lower than any other reported energy moving gas based nonlinear optics to previously inaccessible parameter regimes of high intensity and long interaction length. Um, and we weren't the only people to say this. Uh, in the same uh, journal, the same issue, there was an article by Mike Downer from the Un from University of Texas in Austin, where he said, a new era in the nonlinear optics of gases and maybe even plasmas is about to begin. And one other thing I would like to say, there's a picture here of Feder Ben Abid. He's a director at the CNRS Unité in Limoges in France. And this paper has two breakthroughs in it. One is the first, the first observation of low threshold Raman scattering, but he also Report, we also reported for the first time the Kagome holocore photonic crystal fiber, which guides quite light. <clears throat> That's a picture of him during a visit to uh, the local countryside here a few years ago. So one other thing that emerged from holocore fiber was that uh, if you put gas in there, you can change the pressure of the gas and this allows you to control the dispersion. I talked about dispersion already. The hollow core has anomalous dispersion. You put a material in there, it has normal dispersion. If you change the pressure of a gas, you can tune the dispersion of the, that the light sees, the chromatic dispersion. And this, this turns out to be an incredibly important breakthrough in nonlinear optics of gases um, because you, you can completely transform the, uh, the <clears throat> overall landscape of dispersion as a function of frequency of the light or wavelength of the light uh, just by changing the pressure. And one example of this is, <clears throat> the, is that uh, you can, in a very simple way, take a short pulse, which is already very short, and compress it down to close to a single optical cycle, just by filling an optical fiber with uh, argon gas in this case and adjusting the pressure correctly. You can, you can get the pulse, which starts out uh, with a length given by about 30 femtoseconds here, compress it down to close to a single cycle at the temporal, at the temporal focus. And the intensity course here is extremely high uh, because we've compressed the energy into a very small time interval. Um, and this, not only is this a very convenient way of producing few cycle pulses, it also allows you to get very high intensities and actually allows you to study the effects of ionization and plasma formation, exactly as Mike Garner had, had, uh, had uh, predicted. And I'd just like to talk just for a, a few uh, minutes about this ionization effect, this is, these are simulations of what happens at the temporal focus of this very short pulse. These are the individual oscillations of the light field. So it, it, these are very fast oscillations. These the single, it's a half cycle. Um, uh, they're bumping up and down, it's a carrier wave. This is the envelope of the very short pulse. And at the very high intensity peak of the pulse, the gas becomes ionized. This creates free electrons. This causes the refractive index to 
to change in a negative fashion, to, to fall a little bit. So underneath the pulse, the refractive index is dieting to, an, to a smaller value. Um, and after that, it may more, it stays that way because the lifetime of the electrons is very long compared to the length of the pulse. So the pulse is traveling along and it sees underneath itself a refractive index that is changing in a negative fashion. And this actually creates a continuous blue shift of the pulse uh, wavelength. And as is shown in these simulations, if we launch in light at, uh, in the infrared, uh, we, can, we can cause the, <clears throat> the frequency of the pulse to get higher and higher. This is the first example of the plasma blue shift of a fundamental soliton. There have been observations of this for much more energetic pulses, but this is the first uh, observation for a fundamental soliton. If we go a little bit further beyond this, this temporal focus, um, then it turns out that because it, everything at this point has become so incredibly uh, extreme, very high intensities, very broad bandwidth of light, lots of new frequencies, um, that all the usual approximations break down of, of the kind of optics we would do over here at the beginning, they break down. In fact, uh, what, what can happen here is you can, you can generate with quite high efficiency, a strong ultraviolet light signal in the deep ultraviolet or even the vacuum ultraviolet. This was first observed in the lab by Nicola Jolie, working with the students um, quite a few years ago now. Um, it's a very dramatic effect, and it has led to a whole new generation of ultraviolet light sources. Uh, these are some, this is the, these are the results of a whole series of experiments by Kafai Mack when he was a PhD student in, at the Institute here, showing that you could generate a narrow band light all the way from the visible to even to the vacuum ultraviolet. Vacuum ultraviolet is where uh, where the light, where the ultraviolet light is, is unable to propagate in, in the atmosphere, so you have to work in vacuum. So, uh, so a very nice new source of UV, UV light. So just, just I'd like to answer a question here, why pulse compression and UV generation? I've told you all about the physics, but why bother? Well, one of the things about holocore PCF is that you can get extreme pulse compression at pulse energies that are a thousand times lower than in traditional wide bore capillaries. There's a whole lot of work using wide bore capillaries, but you need millijoule energies to get those to work. This makes it possible to increase the pulse repetition rate up to megahertz away from kilohertz rates. And the reason for this is that if you have a millijoule pulse and you make that happen 10 million times a second, you end up with a massive amount of average power and you simply can't, you can't maintain that in the experiment. So this means that for the first time, frequency cones and optical clocks, so I talked about those a little bit already, are possible in the ultraviolet for the first time, at least feasibly possible. You can also take existing very large scale systems and replace them with compact tabletop lasers that will bring ultrafast laser systems into every laboratory, I think over the next few years. And this opens up new opportunities because they'd be in every lab for studying femtosecond dynamics, very rapid dynamics of biological molecules, for example, such as proteins using femtosecond pulses in this uh, wavelength range. And just one final very exciting uh, prospect that may happen in, over the next few years. It's, it, this also may lead to advances in fundamental physics, such as optically driven nuclear transitions in the vacuum ultraviolet. Um, it's been known for some time or predicted for some time that there is a nuclear transition that is optically accessible in thorium-229. And this, this should happen at around 159 nanometer wavelength, but it has not yet been optically detected. And uh, there's some hope that the, the, these ultraviolet light sources will enable us to, uh, to, to observe this for the first time. This is a picture from the Peite Bay the, in Braunschweig in Germany. So one uh, last uh, topic has to do with light-driven particle motion in holocore PCF, which enables new applications of optical tweezering. Um, now, optic laser tweezers, well, this has become a very important technology. It was invented by Arthur Ashkin uh, back in 1970, I think is the first paper on this. Uh, he had to wait an extremely long time to win the Nobel Prize for this, far too long in my opinion, but anyway, he did eventually get it in 2018. Sadly, he passed away in uh, last year. Uh, and he, he, what he showed was that if you took a laser beam and focused it down to a, a, a tight spot, then you could trap small particles just above the focus. And what we've done is to take this technique and then add, uh, to have some holocore PCF 
and make use of the fact that the hollow that we've managed, we can keep light tightly focused in the hollow core over long distances. Using a guiding beam, we can push the particle, turn the trapping beam off and push the particle into the hollow core where it is held in place by gradient forces because of the <clears throat> intensity gradient of the light across the core, then also pushed along by the radiation pressure of, of the light. So this, this has been uh, a lot of fun playing with this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this idea. Uh, and one example that I often like to show, uh, I'm gonna see if my volume is high enough here. Uh, we did experiments um, in liquid filled hollow core fiber. And in fact, it turns out you can guide multiple particles in this case. And here we use the Doppler effect to monitor the velocity of the two particles. So light comes in, it gets reflected off the particle. If the particle is moving, the wavelength of the light, the frequency of the light changes a little bit. And we can detect that very easily using interferometry. And these are measurements of the speed of the particles over time. If I just play this. So these two particles are kind of having a conversation, I like to say. And the, the reason they're having a conversation is, is that um, higher order modes are Excited in the uh, boy, that's how it's fading. Not good. So they're they're kind of talking to each other through the light, um, and the reason for this is that the particles scatter light from one mode of the core into another one and reflect it back to the first particle and vice versa, and so they affect each other quite strongly. And it really looks as if they're having a conversation the two of them as they travel along. It's kind of weird, strange. It sounds a bit like whistlers, but uh, it isn't whistlers in this case. Uh, one other thing you can do with these particles is use them as flying particle sensors. So here we have a system where we split the laser beam into two, uh, into a forward and a backward component. We, we, uh, we, we put a particle at the entrance to the fiber, turn up the forward power. And we could send the particle along the fiber. It could be hundreds of meters long. We bring it to a halt by balancing the powers at some point where we want to measure something. And once it's there, we could, for example, measure the radiation level. If this was uh, an environment where there was uh, radiation present, uh, we could have a, a, a radioluminescent particle that would produce light that we could then detect at the input of the fiber, telling us whether there's some radiation there. Um, you could also <coughs> have a, a, you can also measure temperature because the velocity of the particle, which you can measure using, using the Doppler effect, uh, the velocity of the particle is, is proportional to the temperature at that local position. Uh, so that's something else you could do. You could monitor the temperature along hundreds of meter path, uh, which could be very interesting for chemical, um, chemical factories, for example, that sort of thing. Uh, you can also put a charged particle in and use that to measure the local electric field. If there is some local electric field, it will push the particle slightly to the side and this will change the transmitted power. And you can then monitor that as, as a way of, of measuring the electric field. And because the particles are so small, they're just a few microns in diameter, the spatial resolution of this, this approach is very, uh, is very high. So you can, you can measure things uh, to resolutions of maybe 10 or 100 microns easily. So one final thing is it, this, uh, these holocore fibers. So this is an idea, a relatively recent idea for continuous monitoring of these PM2.5 particles in the in the environment, uh, there's a lot of worry about these very small particles uh, and the effect they have on human health, particularly on the lungs. And the idea here was that we would, we would take environmental air, we'd filter out the large particles, and then we'd put the remaining very small particles into a laser beam, which is switched on permanently. The particle might wander into the laser beam. It will then get pushed along the hollow core. It'll take a certain amount of time to go from here to here. There'll also be a drop in the transmission, uh, the transmitted power because the particle is in the core. So we have time of flight and transmission drop. If we have a smaller particle, it will go more slowly, uh, which has to do with the way things scale. So this will travel more slowly. So you'll have a longer time of flight and a smaller transmission drop. And if we put in a particle with a higher refractive index, um, it will travel more quickly again because it, it has a higher radiation pressure. And by measuring these two simple parameters, um, we can, so these are just some examples of a polystyrene particle, two microns, one micron, 0.8, 0.625. And you can see the time of 
uh, time of flight is quite different and changes and, and there's a very clear correlation between refractive index and the size of the particles. And in fact, if, uh, if you look into the theory of this, you can actually map out uh, this diagram so that if we measure a particular time of flight and a particular transmission drop, we can read off right away, we can read off the particle diameter and the refractive index independently of each other. Um, and we can do this in a continuous manner. This works really nicely. So and just looking, I have a few minutes left. Um, I've got to the end of the things I decided I would talk about. It was a very, very hard choice. <laughs> I'm not going to read the list, but those are the things I've talked about so far. There are lots of other applications of these fibers. One example that I would love to have talked about was photochemistry, um, uh, which uh, a lot of chemical groups are finally beginning to use uh, for sensitive measurements of, of chemical reactions. But uh, in the last few minutes, what I'd like to do is, is switch from the science and just think a little bit looking back over the last 30 years um, uh, and uh, about the course of the research and the people I've worked with and so on. So if we go back to the very early days uh, in, at the University of Southampton, where I was based, this is a wonderful place for playing with fibers. They have fantastic equipment. Of course, they are limited by, uh, you know, you need to raise funding to do some crazy new experiment. It's not always so easy to try new things, but we did manage to back then. Uh, Southampton, by the way, is the place where the Titanic uh, had its maiden voyage. Um, Titanic was built in my home city of Belfast, where I was born. Um, it came to a very sad end, of course, as we all know. The PCF uh, maiden voyage started there as well, and it hasn't had such a tragic end, at least not yet, um, which is great. But I do want to highlight these two amazing uh, people who worked with me as postdocs joining this crazy project in the very early days when it was far from clear uh, whether anything would actually work. I don't know where that streak has come from. Um, then we moved to the University of Bath, a beautiful place, as I mentioned already, and you can see some of the people here. I wonder if I can get rid of that horrible streak. Um, I don't know why it emerged. Um, anyway, these are some pictures from the group of, in Bath, and you can see some familiar faces here. There's Jonathan, this is Tim Burks again. That's Nicola Jolly, who's with me in Erlangen. William Wadsworth, who did some of the early work on supercontinuum generation. Fabio Biancolano, who spent some time at the Institute here as well. He now, he's now in Harriet Watt University. There's Feda Benabid again, Goshuel Cesar, Sergio Leon Saval. These people are all over the scattered all over the world. Um, and I should apologize to George Kakarantzis. That's the only nice picture I had of him. He happens to be drinking a beer back then. Um, and this guy here is the first guy who got his the first PhD thesis on photonic crystal fiber, Brian Mangan. He's based in the US now. Uh, at this time, the time of the picture, he was involved in Blaze Photonics, the spin-off company that came out of the University of of Bath. And then finally, I moved to Erlangen, um, uh, again to empty labs, and we had to set everything up for, uh, afresh. These are pictures of the group over the years. Um, lots of faces you recognize. Actually, some of these pictures include lots of visitors. You may uh, identify some of the visitors in this case. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, Roy Taylor from Imperial, and I couldn't possibly go through all the names. There isn't time. But it's been a fantastic um, uh, time of 30 years of working with all these talented and energetic and creative people. Um, it's, it's one of the greatest things about, about doing research. Anyway, if you happen to visit Erlangen, I recommend that you, uh, you head off into the countryside and you may come upon an everyday scene like this in the countryside in the area of Erlangen. This, by the way, is Mittelfranken. This is how people dress. You know, they have these nice hats and parasols and so on. Um, uh, so you may, you may come upon a family like that in Mittelfranken. It's actually part of Bavaria, but the people in Mittelfranken regard themselves as independent of Bavaria. You may also come upon this grasshopper, which I give this, the short name of Erdi. This is a beautiful blue-winged grasshopper that, act, that nearly canceled the new building of the Max Planck Society, um, but uh, it turned out it didn't in the end, but a very beautiful insect nevertheless. So that's all I planned to, uh, to talk about today. So that was three decades riding the photonic crystal fiber wave, and I don't think it has yet broken. There's still a lot to be explored and many uh, new applications and discoveries. So thank you. Uh, thank you for, um, for joining the lecture.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this fascinating, visually appealing, acoustically enriched right along the uh, photonic crystal fiber wave. I think this was not so much right along the wave than fireworks going off. Um, and no wonder that we attracted, you attracted more than, and, and held the attention of more than 250 participants, which is a record number. So um, very, thank you very much for this presentation. There are already some questions piling up in the chat. Um, I would like to hand over to Orad Reshev, who had the first question. Oh, okay. Hi. I thought uh, you'd be reading my question out for me. Um, this is a really nice talk. I thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my question is about your um, chiral twisted fibers, um, which you said uh, will guide circularly polarized light. And then you show that if you bend it, it actually goes to the inside of the bend and not the outside. Yeah. And so it's well, it's well known that if you have just a typical fiber and you bend it, that the light will eventually leak out of the outside. And so then you have sort of like a, a minimum bend radius. Yeah. So my question is if this negative effective mass that your you, these, these modes have, does that translate into having no minimum bend radius? It could easily, yes, a very good, um, very good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, yes, will it, I've, I've asked this question myself. I mean, since yeah. it goes to the inside of the bend, will it leak? Um, and I guess the answer is, if the photonic crystal was infinitely big, then it wouldn't leak. It would keep just it would actually get compressed a little bit. So the mode should get get a little bit smaller, I suppose. Um, it's a very good question. I'm not sure, but I, I think in the end, it, it's it's bound to leak at some point because the crystal is never infinitely big. Um, but on the inside, mm -hmm. on the inside, yeah, that's the funny thing, right? On the outside, yeah. it it would have to be infinitely big. But on the inside, if you're bending it in and in and in. At some point, it's seeing itself, and then it sees the photonic crystal on the other side of the inside of the bend, right? Yes. yes. So it's it's subtly different than just if if it leaks towards the outside. This is this is why like I haven't anyway. I, I have no idea how it would simulate this type of thing either because it's like a three D chiral bent thing that has circularly polarized light. This is way I beyond should, me. Yeah. Yeah, I should have said. I mean, Gordon Wong is the guy who did the simulation mm. of this of this effect uh, of the of the uh, of the. Let me go back if I can get that to play. Yeah, it's like a heroic effort. This, so this, this simulation. This, yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it is a very good question uh, as to what uh, happens. Uh, does do you never actually get any leakage? It's possible. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. No, nope. thank you for the question. Um, the second question was by Nisreen. Yeah, yes, hi. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, my question is about the uh, if, if we can use this um, photonic crystal in improving the charge generation in uh, solar cells, for example, or because you, uh, you mentioned the ionization effect. So, so, ooh, I mean, can you use it in, in solar cells? I, I'm not sure how you do that. Um, I, I haven't worked on this myself, but, uh, but optical fibers have been suggested as a means of concentrating light through fluorescence. So the sunlight hits the fiber from the side and the core is made from a, a luminescent material that kind of captures the energy and, 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 and channels it along the fiber to the input of the fiber. And so it acts as a kind of way of focusing energy. I haven't worked on that myself, um, but uh, these, I don't think these fibers would, the photonic crystal fiber may not be the way to do that. Um, so uh, apart mm. from that, I'm, I'm not sure if there are any applications mm -hmm. of photonic crystal fibers and it would be nice, but. <laughs> okay, uh, good, thank you. Solar energy, yeah. Okay, there was a question by Sven Rogacev. Yes, I'm here. How much information, like bits, can go through the PCF at maximum? Or is there no maximum because you can modulate with perfect frequency? So the information um, density that you could send, well, that, that just, uh, that's just given by the bandwidth of the light, um, the, the limit. So um, if, if the fiber can guide a very broad bandwidth of light, then you can potentially um, send a huge amount of information, um, but it's limited by the frequency of the light, of course. Um, so and the bandwidth of the light. So in principle, if you had a, a three octave uh, wide bandwidth, then you had a fiber that could guide all those frequencies with very low loss. 
you could send a, an incredible amount of information at, at one time along the fiber. That's true. We don't have a fiber like that yet. Mostly the, the bandwidth is some, somehow limited uh, by all kinds of effects like bend loss that we talked about a moment ago and, and so on and leakage and then the material itself starts to absorb. Yeah. Don't know if that answers you or not. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, and uh, another question by Onis Shukov. Okay, uh, I can read out the question. I mean, the question is, uh, are there any new promising PCF types developed recently, apart from the ones that you presented? Um, I think, I think uh, well, I mean, there, there are always uh, slight variations of the types of fiber that uh, we work with. And by adjusting the design, you can get different properties, of course. But I, I think the most exciting one is this single ring anti-resonant reflecting uh, type of structure. This was first um, proposed, first reported by a group in Moscow um, uh, with uh, Yevgeny Dianov, who, who passed away a few years ago, sadly. But his group came up with the idea of, they call this the revolver fiber. <laughs> it looks like the barrel of a gun. Uh, you put bullets in these holes, but uh, anyway, that was their name for it. And uh, this, this fiber is, is proving to be uh, very, very interesting for all, kind of, all kinds of nonlinear um, applications when it's gas filled, but also potentially as a, as a new kind of telecommunications fiber. And a number of groups are looking into that, including my former group in, in Southampton. I think there's even a startup company that are developing that type of fiber for telecommunications. Um, and I also have a question that kind of relates to that because you were pointing out um, increasingly the applications of what the fibers are enabling to do. Um, I was wondering, what do you see? I mean, it seems like you've done everything that can be done in terms of the, the light, the physics. What do you think are, or are there any like important big steps on the fundamentals of optics of light inside of structured fibers? Is there anything that's still left to do? I, I tend to say that uh, we all do applied physics these days, unless we're doing fundamental particle physics or something like that, or maybe looking at the extreme edges of the universe. Um, most of the laws are understood, except perhaps in quantum optics, <laughs> which is still a bit of a mystery. Um, but I think in, the, in terms of fibers, I mean, it is applied physics, really. So, I mean, it's down to your imagination within the, within the laws of physics. I mean, you can do a certain number of things. As to whether there's anything completely new, I'm not sure. I, I think it's, um, I mean, there's always, there are always opportunities for other, other materials I mean, using different glasses. Uh, um, there are opportunities, and in fact, this is being explored by some of our collaborators at the moment who work in biology, looking at brain studies. So imaging things in the brain using fibers, they're, they're actually using the hollow channels as a means of delivering drugs um, at the same time as, as using light to probe what's going on. So the hollow channels, um, I mean, put in a very sim simple way, the hollow channels are interesting and a hollow core is interesting simply because you can put stuff into it. You can't do that with a solid fiber. It's completely solid, but the hollow fiber, it opens up all kinds of new opportunities uh, because, right. it's, because it's empty. Yeah. Yeah. So that there's nothing in one of your lab books from back when that would still open another, I don't know, similar, similar development. If there was, uh, I would probably be pursuing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're, we're coming, I think, to the end of the questions. There was still one question if you're related to the philosopher Bertrand Russell. I guess that's a no, right? So what was that again? The, the philosopher Bertrand. Bertrand. Am I related to him? Yes. I, I, when I was at Oxford, you know, it's a very snooty place. Oxford University, it can be. It was when I was there. I, I used to tell people I was his, his, his nephew or something like that, but I wasn't. I wasn't. That was, a, that was Irish, what we call Irish truth. It made a good story, but it wasn't correct. <laughs> All right. Um, I think with that, we should end um, our uh, distinguished lecture seminar today. Philip, thank you very much again for this awesome presentation. Um, before um, I let everyone go, I want to like I would like to point out one thing, and that is that we have a series, right? So this is continuing. Um, I put up, I hope you can see this, the, the schedule for the next weeks and months. So um, 
not this week, but next week, Thursday, on the 27th of May, if we have Christine Silberhorn um, and uh, you can see the other speakers. So if you're interested in this kind of topic, the science of light, um, please make sure that you tune in. And uh, with that, um, I thank everyone for attending today and I hope that you have a nice afternoon and see you around. Goodbye.